Hi, so here in section 11 we'll see whether any of these theories we've shown so far hold any water. It's really about measurements of quantities like band gaps and effective masses. Can these things really be measured? And they really validate some of the theories that were derived here. Again, we'll need uh, aspects of uh, these real materials. We need constant energy surfaces, we need the Brion zone, and we need the band structure. So, going back to these important things we need to remember, we derived the density of states that in three dimension goes as the square root of e. Uh, it, the quantum number k um, uh, really entered our system originally through Schrodinger's equation, but it's really also a, a momentum discretization for our infinitely periodic space. Um, each band has exactly k or n number of states in it, depending on the discretization. And um, we need the density of states to calculate a differential way of how many electrons are in our structure, um, or can be in our structure, as a, as a function of energy. So, how do we measure band gaps? Um, that's a, still a relatively easy experiment to make, so consider a band structure like this, where the valence bands are full, the conduction bands are empty, and photons can uh, be absorbed in such a structure between bands that are filled and empty states. So a photon can hit the structure and elevate an electron from the valence band into the conduction band, and the photon absorption, if you uh, uh, do a... Um, measurement that resolves the wavelength of the photons, you will see an absorption at a, spe a specific energy. Let's call that energy 2,3, de uh, defining here the band 2 to band 3. So if you uh, hit uh, a, the system with a slightly larger uh, photon energy, you can get an absorption here, like indicated with a red electron, at a slightly higher um, energy. And um, it's still a direct transition. And what you really measure physically is that you shine light on the system and you measure how much light is being absorbed uh, on specific energy. Now, we know that the bands are finite in their extent. So we know that over here, we have approximated this with a parabola, but we also know that the band eventually ends. So the density of states is proportional to square root of E here at the beginning of the band, but it's also proportional to the square root of E here at the tail end of the band as well. So overall, you expose a, a finite bandwidth, and if you are hitting, if you're hitting the band edge on the upper uh, band edge here, there, you won't find any um, available electrons that can go up in here. So you uncover the band gap here. Okay, so you will not find electrons here. Uh, or absorption in that energy range. But you will find, again, absorption up at, an, at a higher energy, so here. All right, so you can map out um, the bands and you can probe the density of states, the availability of the um, states in the system. Now, if you look really carefully, you will also find states here and what you think is the band gap. And that has to do with scattering events, with phonon, relaxation on virtual states, so that band gap is actually not perfectly sharp, but it also has an um, inclusion of some phonon effects, vibrational effects, so there can be a small absorption of electrons also below the band gap. All right, so I mentioned the word, it's a direct transition. What that means is you can have an electron um, be absorbed, uh, um, getting kicked up in energy by a photon up here, and it's called a vertical transition um, because photons have a negligible uh, momentum. So, and we conserve momentum in these transitions from here to here, from here to here, and um, both energy and momentum are conserved. And the photon has a negligible um, uh, electron uh, momentum compared to the electron. So, there is a tiny momentum transfer, but on these scales that we're showing here, it is zero. Now, there, um, there's other semiconductors, like we mentioned, the silicon and the germanium, 
that are not direct. So here's an animation that we put onto uh, Wikipedia a long time ago that we made with a NanoHub tool. So here you can look at the central bands uh, for the typical materials we're interested in these days. And you find that silicon and germanium have indirect, gap, indirect gaps. So there, you have to have a more complicated process. In order to um, explore a transition or a band gap from here to here, you need to excite a photon and then compensate with a phone, uh, an you need to excite an electron and it needs to be transferred by a phonon. It's a, a three particle process, a vibrational process that is slower and it is less efficient. So that's what also why um, you, you don't have silicon as a, as a high uh, powered uh, LED, for example, because photon, uh, electron emission, photon emission is going to be hampered by the need to have a third particle around to conserve momentum. All right, but nevertheless, you can do measurements of the uh, band gap. And here is a traditional example of a band gap um, a measurement for the typical materials. Germanium has the lowest band gap in the class of three. Then there's silicon and then there's gallium arsenide. And you can fit those to certain temperature dependencies as indicated here. Okay, so band gap is energy dependent. All right, now we got the band gaps down. Now let's look at some of the effective masses and we'll do that in the next section.